Hey guys, yesterday I put out a video where I talked about which Linux distribution I would recommend to newcomers coming to Linux for the first time from Windows. Uh, I was asked specifically for a cookie cutter approach, which I took to mean a distribution that I could just give to someone and they could go off and work it out for themselves rather than something that I'd have to set up for someone. Um, now I chose Ubuntu, that was like my one word answer. It's certainly not the only springboard you can use to get into the Linux community, but the reason I chose it was because for all intents and purposes, it's the most popular. Therefore, it has the largest community and it has the largest software selection for the most part. Um, and it, um, you know, is just sort of easier to Google for when, when stuff goes wrong. Uh, it also tends to mean that it's going to hang around a little longer. There are so many Linux distributions that have gone out of business after a couple of years of, um, you know, of, of building software. So I wanted to choose something that ticked as many of those boxes as possible. Uh, the documentation and community was particularly important because uh, if I wasn't there to give help, then there needed to be, you know, some way or some method of support. I knew I was going to get a lot of challenge on the, you know, on that particular choice. So I did kind of think that I might do a follow up video explaining more about my choices. The reason I didn't include it in the last video was because I wanted to keep the last video a little bit more simple and straightforward for people that might be, you know, who, who might be more sincere in that question. I know that most of you guys on this channel are seasoned Linux users and therefore uh, that, you know, yesterday's video wasn't really for you. So I was actually a bit anxious in putting it up because it it's a video for people who, who, who aren't, you know, who aren't usually subscribed to this channel. But... Uh, you guys had a lot to say on it, and I think a lot of your comments deserves some consideration. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them today. I'm not going to read through the list of comments. I've got them up here on my computer monitor, but I'm just going to be glancing on some of the main points that you guys put up. This is going to be a rather rambly video, so I apologize for that in advance. And I also, before I begin, want to give a genuine heartfelt thank you for keeping it civil. Um, I feel that it's increasingly rare now on the internet that we can have like disagreements and discussions without it descending into snide remarks and name calling and you know sort of the emotional hot tempered comments that you tend to see. You guys were absolutely grown up and mature about it and this is why making videos for YouTube for me at least is an absolute pleasure. So thank you very much guys. I appreciate you acting like the mature adults that you you are. So um, it means a lot to me because if the comment section of my channel was, was kind of crummy and horrible, I, I would be less inclined to make videos and certainly less inclined to make videos where I actually sort of engage with you guys a little more directly. So again, means a lot to me. It's it's one of the, the best things that you guys do for this channel in terms of support is just making sure that the comment section is is sensible, grown up, mature and intelligent. So thank you very much for that one. Okay, so the first point that you guys raised, and this is a very, very, very legitimate point. This is actually what made the video a little, like, you know, this is what, what I considered probably the most in the video, is that recommending Ubuntu could be a bit of a risky move, considering that they're going to be changing their desktop environment very soon to GNOME. In fact, they're going to be changing it in their next release, I believe in 1710, they're going to be trialing out their GNOME desktop for the first time. So why am I recommending to a distribution to people who in six months down the line are going to have to learn an entirely different workflow? Well, because the continuity of the brand Ubuntu is easier um, to, for people to stick with than uh, having to go from Ubuntu GNOME and then to Ubuntu in a six month period. So you already have, you know, if you recommend Ubuntu GNOME, they're already going to have to change their distribution six months down the line rather than just their desktop environment, if that kind of makes any sense. So um, a lot of people new to Linux from Windows are probably not going to understand the nuances of different variations as well as we are right now. So telling them that, that you have to go to Ubuntu GNOME now, but six months down the line you have to go to Ubuntu because they're checking for the continuity of the desktop. When most people can, can work out a change of desktop environment relatively easily in my experience. And a lot of the disagreements that we seem to have seem to come from like what we expect the average computer user to be and what the average computer user looks for. And that is always difficult for people like us because we're not average computer users. We tend to be power users or Linux users or programmers or people that do you know sysadmin or security or that kind of stuff. So um, or even just enthusiasts, you know, enthusiasts and people that have been using computers for a long time and enjoy using them. Um, it is sometimes difficult to be empathic towards uh, people who aren't interested in computers and aren't uh, particularly tech savvy. And sometimes you can give people the benefit of the doubt a little bit too much. And sometimes um, 
you can absolutely assume people are idiots when they're not. And I, you know, I, I think there is a, a sensible middle ground, and I'm sure you guys do as well. It's just finding that is incredibly difficult. So I thought, well, look, you know, if you need a one word answer, Ubuntu, yes, you're going to have to learn a different desktop environment six months down the line. Truth be told, I do really like GNOME and I don't like Unity at all. But as far as the they if you can learn one, you can learn the other re reasonably easily. Like it's, um, you know, they, they both use like a dashboard kind of way of doing things. They both have favorite icons on the left hand side of the screen. Um, so I, I think, you know, even if you take one or two steps in, um, in, in the, on the Ubuntu side of things to make GNOME a little bit more like Unity, but only a little bit, just so there's a continuity bridge, then you know that 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 to me would solve it. I, I a few of you guys did raise the point. You know the the transition from Unity to GNOME would just blow the mind of of a new user, which I I'm not entirely convinced would be the case. You might have to explain it to them, uh, uh, but but then there will probably be some Ubuntu news or documentation that would explain it to them as, as well. So. Um, and if you're using the long-term support release, like again, this, this, you know, we've got to try and work out how often is our average computer user going to be updating their operating system. Because if we put them onto the latest long-term support release, uh, 1604, they don't really have to then upgrade until 2021. So they could still be on Unity for a pretty long time. And forgive me if my math is wrong on that. But um, yeah, like it's... Um, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's only if they're upgrading every six months that they're going to see that massive break in continuity. And um, that would probably be the first thing that I'd ask them and work out is like, do you want the long term support? Do you want the short term support? If you're upgrading every six months, I would probably ask, you know, tell them to expect certain changes like that. Um, and I don't think it, it, it would necessarily flummox them too much but I, I you know I get the point I get you know I, I get that it it was something that almost made me go with with other distributions as well um, a few of you guys did recommend Linux Mint and I have done so in the past um, and Linux Mint actually like in terms of that sp the specific question that was asked a cookie cutter one size fits all design for Windows users coming across to Linux Linux Mint was pretty much designed for that you know as the answer to that question and and I was a hair's breadth away from recommending it. Um, and if someone else recommended it now, I'd I'd, um, I'd go along with it. Like it's a perfectly valid choice. There are some things. There are some reasons why I didn't include it as my primary recommendation. But it's certainly a, a, a good choice because it does have that uh, user interface that's similar to Windows. I don't think that's as big an issue as as many of you guys um, uh, raised it as. But I, you know, it it. it it's you know more continuity i guess is, is is probably a little bit easier for the windows users but also the applications they include with uh, mint tend to be more cross platform rather than linux specific i know that's not much of a difference to to those of us that use linux full time and and therefore just as long as it's available for linux we're happy um but because things like you know thunderbird and firefox and so forth are, i mean those are pretty standard across many distributions but uh vlc and stuff like that they you know they seem to include as many cross platform so that you can then even sort of migrate more gradually from windows to linux for example you can start installing vlc firefox and thunderbird and all that kind of stuff and gimp um on your windows partition and then uh, what, when you when you feel comfortable using those tools, just just uh, switch out the operating system from beneath it. It seems, and you're still using the same programs. It's just your um, your desktop environment looks a little different. So yeah, you know, it's uh, Mint is definitely a, a front runner in that department. The one thing that would hesitate uh, that I would hesitate about. Uh, recommending it is that it does use the long-term support release of Ubuntu. And whereas for the majority of cases, I think that is um, is fine, uh, you've got to again think of the person who's coming from Windows, like why are they coming from Windows? Because a lot of people come to Linux expecting something a little bit more challenging, expecting it to be... Um, you know, they're not necessarily looking for a switch in replacement. They are actually looking to take advantage of some of the strengths that Linux operating systems have. And they do have the enthusiasm to learn new ways of doing things as well. So trying to emulate Windows as much as possible, um, you know, is, is um, you know, it, it's not, it can be problematic at times. Um, but... Um, but it's a solid distribution. And again, the long-term support release means that the software, 
might be a little bit older than it can can be and that can be a problem and the reason why it can be a problem is because from time to time i'm asked to install something like skype for example now um skype uh is being is, is currently in beta for linux the new skype the uh, the they call it Skype for Le yeah Skype for Linux and it's an Electron app so it's cross-platform and it's updated pretty regularly which is pretty good so it looks like Microsoft are actually serious about supporting Skype on Linux for you know in interesting reasons there um, however it is more difficult to install on Linux Mint last time I checked because there is more stuff out of date it's not so on top of like fast moving software. So if you do need something like that, and I do get asked about Skype quite regularly, that's probably the the that's the 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 application I get asked about most that doesn't that is a little bit tricky, and and yeah, just basically installing Skype on Linux Mint is it's not impossible, it's not difficult, but it isn't something that I would necessarily suggest someone do on their own if they've just moved from Windows. Whereas there is a, a little bit more of a chance when it comes to to um, Ubuntu. Of course, of course, the easiest uh, Ubuntu based distribution to install Skype for Linux beta, beta on is Ubuntu Mate because of the software boutique and it pulls in the official repository for it, I think, and um, and installs it single click like you would in the in the software boutique, which I think is amazing and brilliant and every distribution should do it. So I guess from that point of view, um, Ubuntu Mate is a good choice. So I'll get on to that. A lot of you guys actually also recommended uh, Ubuntu Mate. And I have recommended Ubuntu Mate in the past. In fact, when someone I know comes to me and wants to wants me to put Linux onto their machine, nowadays it tends to be Ubuntu Mate through and through. It's been a while since I've recommended anything else. Um, and the reason for that is, is because um, the UI is straightforward. And you can make it to be whatever, you know, like the UI is customizable, but it is straightforward. You can just put like it as a Windows layout without even breaking a sweat. Again, not the biggest of issues, but it's, you know, something that you can do. You can also put it with the uh, the, the standard layout when you've got the um, the menu at the top and the tasks down at the bottom. That was the first um, desktop layout that I ever used um, when this was my main distribution for the very first time back in... I think it was about 06, I think it was, with one of the early fedoras. And uh, basically they had the, the panel at the top, the panel at the bottom, very different to Windows, picked it up and used it um, without breaking a sweat. Like it was so intuitive, even though it was different to Windows. So just because something isn't the same as the Windows layout with the taskbar at the bottom and all that kind of stuff doesn't mean that it isn't intuitive and easy to pick up. Um, but with Ubuntu Mate, the software boutique makes installing software so easy that, you, you know, you, you don't even have to set it up for someone else. You just have to tell them where the software boutique is and, 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 and let them be, you know, let them know it. Because a lot of people, I find, when you do recommend, when you get them onto Linux and they want to install software, they will go off onto the internet looking for like an EXE file to download and install. Okay, so there was a few comments that talked about the GNOME desktop just not being user-friendly and that being a big problem in recommending new users to it. Now, when I started on Linux, I used the GNOME of the time, which was GNOME 2, um, which was different to... Um, the Windows layout because I used it on Fedora and it had that two panel layout which I really liked and I found that super intuitive. So I feel that the GNOME desktop through 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 its history has been quite good at actually being very intuitive to new users and I can't, even though it is different to the Windows layout and it is different to the Windows workflow. When people are coming across from Windows, they're expecting things to be different. They're in, you know, they're in that mode where they are opening their mind to learning a few new uh, ways of doing things. Now, we're not necessarily talking about learning an entire new uh, subject or field of reading, but really just more, you know, a, a just a, just a different way how menus work. And to be honest, when you are dealing with a large number of applications that you're not necessarily familiar with, and um, you just want a quick and convenient access to everything that your system can do. The ability to just push down the super Windows meta key and then start typing uh, for what you want and then it coming up in a search is really, really useful. That's a really convenient and really good search in, in GNOME. Um, you can even type in things like web browser and it will come up with Firefox or internet and it'll come up, you know, you can be, it's quite good in terms of, of, of what you type into search, which again makes it particularly useful for, for newcomers. You can have the, you know, it also gives you favorited um, 
uh, icons as well. So you can just drag a few of the, the common used programs there and then you're, you're pretty much good to go. It's just, you know, if you want to look at, have an overview of your system, you just move the, the cursor to the top left-hand corner. You've got all of your, your, your open desktops, uh, your, your open windows laid out in front of you with what's on them sort of, uh, you know, displayed in a preview. And that, to me, is so intuitive to, to task switching. When it comes to GNOME, I don't see it as being a particularly um, unintuitive desktop environment to use. Uh, they've actually cut away a lot of the customizability features, so there's less to overwhelm newcomers. And to be honest, when you can just, you know, put your cursor into the top left-hand corner of the screen and have a dashboard of everything that you're working on, or your desktops, or your open windows, your favorite icons, and then the search, uh, the search bar there as well, you've got everything that you need just at the push of the Windows Meta Super Key. Um, it's all in one place, and it all seems to be particularly easy for newcomers. Now, I've not necessarily trialed it out in, in any meaningful way, so this is just my intuition here, and I could very well be wrong. Out of the people who I've worked with um, with Linux, um, the most user-friendly desktop environment I've found um, has been LXDE, the really, really lightweight one, or more specifically, the Lubuntu distribution. Um, because there is so little to it, and because it is just effectively Windows 95, but brought up uh, to the modern day with modern day features, but still um, has that essence of a very simple, uh, straightforward, traditional desktop environment, a lot of people I know have just jumped straight into it and had zero problems whatsoever, even though it's super lightweight and not generally recommended for newcomers. There is very much the case of where you have to set it up and then you've got a very strong distribution. Um, and especially with Lubuntu, where they tend to include a lot of the really lightweight apps that a lot of people might not find super intuitive. So you might want to uh, take out Abbey Word and stick on LibreOffice. But other than that, um, you know, Lubuntu is not a bad <laughs> uh, distribution for newcomers. The thing is, there is no shortage of great distributions for people new to Linux, uh, especially if all you want is the, you know, the basic tools. Um, and I suppose, again, going back to, to why I recommended Ubuntu is because a lot of third-party software is made and supported for Ubuntu. Uh, OBS was for, first brought out for Ubuntu. Um, Steam was first brought out for Ubuntu. And when you make games for Steam, you're, design, des you're supposed to design them to work in Ubuntu, and then Steam kind of uses um, its you know, ca compatibility libraries and whatnot to make it work on other Linux distributions. And fair play to Valve, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to make Steam so available on so many Linux distributions, but they, just, they did, and that's really good of them. Um, and I think that, like, I know that Valve get uh, just a bit of a tangent, get a lot of flack for their DRM, but they have brought thousands of games to Linux in a really convenient way, really cost effective, and they their, their client has been made really, really well and works, in my experience, flawlessly across a range of Linux distributions. Not only that, but they've also gathered up a lot of support and enthusiasm for developing things like, um, gra uh, you know, like graphic software and uh, drivers and libraries and whatnot for Linux as well. So, you know, Valve and Steam have, uh, in my in my personal view, have done wonders for Linux, even if, um, you know, even, even if even if the DRM is a problem. But anyway, uh, I'm going to wrap up the video here. This has been very long and very rambly, and I'm about to lose some light now. So um, I'm going to try and get this edited and uploaded. But thank you very much for sticking with me. Thank you very much for your, your, your comments. Um, this is one of those situations where it's like, yeah, well, you know, Ubuntu is, is my recommendation, I guess, um, even though it comes with a few asterisks. Um, Linux Mint would have been great just as well. Elementary would have been fine. Um, Solus probably would have been fine in a large number of cases. Um, and uh, and I actually, one of you guys did actually recommend uh, Linux Mint Debian Edition, LMDE. Um, and partly because of the upgrade process is that because LMDE is a continual upgrade process, whereas the scheduled releases could be abrupt to some people. That was a really well-made point. And, um, and I think I just wanted to include it in the video because... Um, if Linux Mint decided to, to make their flagship distribution based on Debian testing, it could very well have changed my answer. It could very well have changed my answer. But, the only, but, but I suppose the only reason why I wouldn't have recommended Linux Mint Debian Edition is simply because I, um, I don't believe that like, the amount of time has gone into it that has gone into other Linux Mint distributions. Like If they put all their effort into the Linux Mint Debian Edition, 
that would be um, that would be a real challenge to all other Linux distributions that are designed for general purpose, I think. Thanks very much for watching. That's about it from me today. Until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.